introduce our last speaker, our last speaker, <laughs> James Robertson, who I think in many ways needs no introduction to ASLS because he's been a long time supporter and friend of ASLS. As we've already heard today, he's also a champion of writing in Scots through his work for Catalonia and Itchy Coo. But above all, James is one of our foremost Scottish writers and perhaps unusually writes novel short stories and poems, so working in, in all the varieties of Scottish literature. Um, and of course, those novels include The Fanatic, Joseph Knight, Gideon Mack, and The Landley Still. He's a double award winner of the Saltire Prize, which is great credit to the quality of his writing. Most recently, James has published News of the Dead, which was serialized on Radio 4. So I hope some of you caught it on Radio 4. And like James's other fictions, News of the Dead really gives us a sense of the way in which he can very powerful, powerfully relate questions about Scotland's past and Scotland's history to issues which are very relevant for today. So it's as a writer that James is going to be talking to us this afternoon. So, James. Thanks very much, Ali. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, great. That's excellent. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to speak uh, about my experience as a writer over the last 50 years. And it was with some horror that I realised that I have actually been writing for something like 50 years. Um, uh, the year that the Association for Scottish Literary Studies was born, I was 12 years old and I was already busy writing. I'd been given a typewriter, a manual typewriter, two years earlier by my parents and I was busy bashing out westerns at that point. Uh, that was uh, where I was headed. I'd never been anywhere near the Wild West, but that was what I was interested in. And, uh, and so that was what I was writing. I had no sense whatsoever that anything called Scottish literature existed. Um, and, and I think that's worth bearing in mind as I, as I talk through the next half hour or thereabouts, that my experience as a writer uh, may have nothing in common with other writers in Scotland. And it's also, I think, worth remembering that a writer can be a writer in Scotland and have no interest whatsoever in all the things that those of us gathered here at the Gay today get engaged by, sometimes outraged by. Uh, you can be a writer in Scotland and take all your influences and, and uh, interests from somewhere completely different, somewhere completely out with the world of Scottish literature that we inhabit. But for me, uh, th that is not the case. For me, uh, my writing over the career over the last uh, few decades is absolutely uh, bound up with the, the whole idea of Scottish literature and language. Um, a few years after uh, I acquired the typewriter, by the age of about 15, I had definitely begun to read uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, um, uh, partly because I grew up in Bridge of Allen and uh, there were lots of associations um, uh, with Stevenson because he used to go there as a, as a child and a young man to take the, the waters at the spa. So I was familiar with Stevenson as a, as a sort of literary figure. I didn't know much about him. I'd read Treasure Island um, by the time I was about 15. And I'd also read for the first of many times uh, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And um, I don't know whether it was that or not, but I, I submitted a short story to a competition that was being run by uh, uh, one of the publishers that Marion mentioned, um, uh, the Edinburgh University Students Publication Board, which was the forerunner of Polygon. And um, they put an ad in the paper, which I'd spotted, um, inviting submissions of short stories. I sent a story in and um, amazingly, they accepted it for a, a wee publication called Genie, G-E-N-I-E. Uh, which came out in 1974. I was 16. I was by some distance the youngest contributor. Uh, one of the other contributors, interestingly enough, was um, Billy Kay, who had a short story published uh, about a mining disaster in his native Ayrshire, written entirely in Scots. And that was my second exposure to uh, seeing fiction uh, prose in Scots. The first having been reading Thrawn Janet by uh, by Stevenson. So that was kind of interesting for me to see um, those two uh, stories 
a hundred years apart or thereabouts, um, um, but uh, but still very much recognisably written in the same language. Anyway, my story was called Me Over There, and I, I don't know whether it was the influence of Jekyll and Hyde, but there was definitely a, a theme of doubles uh, going on in there. Although, again, it's worth saying that I had also recently seen a rather good film, as I remember it, um, starring Roger Moore called The Man Who Haunted Himself. And um, I think that might have played just as much uh, uh, a part in, in influencing that, that wee story. Anyway, uh, that story earned me the then really enormous sum of 20 pounds, um, um, which was, was really, a, a, a really a very large sum of money indeed in 1974. Um, and um, I didn't earn anything like that again for, uh, for my writing for at least 10 or 12 years. Um, I went on to university to Edinburgh and I studied history. Um, the big moment for me, I, I, I was writing all the time. I was, I was writing poems, I was um, writing, um, still writing Westerns and, and I was dipping my, my toes into other areas. But the thing that really changed for me was in 1978, two things happened. The first thing was that Hugh McDermott died. I had never heard of Hugh McDermott, um, but reading the obituaries, uh, I realised that there was uh, something very important about this person. He seemed to be a big cultural figure. Uh, I'd never heard of him, I'd never read anything by him, and I thought it was time that I found out what was going on there. The other thing that happened almost simultaneously was that as a student at Edinburgh University, I got the opportunity to go on an exchange scheme to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And so uh, I went there for a year at the tail end of the 1970s. First time I had ever been outside the British Isles, first time I'd ever been out, I'd been on an aeroplane. It was complete and utter culture shock. And I think those two things, um, this, beginning to just find out about McDermott and read his, his, his words, his poems and his prose, which I located in the University of Pennsylvania library when I got there, and also being out with Scotland, those two things I think operated on my brain uh, simultaneously. Um, I think it's very often the case you have to step outside of what you know in order to know it a bit better. And uh, certainly when I came back a year later, I think I had a very different view of Scotland and its culture than I had had when I left. Um, so that was a big important moment for me. Uh, there's been so much talk today, really brilliant actually. It's been really amazing listening to, to, to most of the talks. I had to tune out of one or two, but the summaries that Rory and, and, and Kirsten and everybody else has given about what has happened over the last 50 years is, is just astonishing. What has happened? A huge amount has happened. Um, and one of the things, just very briefly, I can remember when I was studying history at Edinburgh in the, in the, in the 1970s, it was almost impossible to study any Scottish history if you were in the main history department. It was timetabled uh, in such a way that that made it difficult. Also, the Scottish history department then was, was in a kind of ghetto in another part of, uh, it, was just, it was away from the main history department. It was up a stair uh, on the clue place, as far as I remember. And I remember one of the, the, the lecturers that I had, he was a really good lecturer and a good teacher, rather dismissively uh, uh, mocking the study of Scottish history as being not about real history. And I think that was a, a quite a pervasive attitude towards not just Scottish history at that time, but Scottish literature and culture. And of course, one of the things that I think the ASLS was founded to do was to try to, to redress uh, some of those perceptions. Um, I, uh, after university, I, I went and did various things, um, but it was always my intention um, to, 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 to be a writer and, and to, to make my living as a writer if I could do so. Reading about, reading McDermott uh, and then reading about what McDermott said about Scottish literature and culture opened the door to me to this entire world that I had no idea existed, that hadn't been I hadn't been told anything about it in my education. My parents uh, were very literate and they had lots of books in the house, but there were very few Scottish books and there were very few books that even the Scottish books, you know, there were a few volumes of Walter Scott and Stevenson and John Buchan, um, but they were not deemed to be 
part of something called Scottish literature. They just happened to be um, uh, books that were on the shelves next to uh, everything else. Um, anyway, like I said, uh, it was always my intention to, to, to be a writer. And it's worth remembering also, we've had these wonderful summaries today of the infrastructure that now exists around literature in Scotland in all kinds of ways. There was nothing there in the 1970s and very little even in the 80s for a writer, any writer. I'm, I'm not saying that was a bad thing, it was just how it was. Um, so if you wanted to, to be published, you had to find out how to do it yourself. And um, my route to that was to go down to the local library in Bridge of Allen and hunt around on the shelves until I came across a book called the, the Writers and Artists Yearbook. And that told you how you wrote a, a submission letter to a publisher and that you should never, ever, ever send the same work off to two publishers at once. It was very strict about these kind of rules and regulations that you were supposed to stick to. And like so many other folk at that time, um, that's what I did. I followed those rules and sent um, novels and things off to publishers, luckily all of which were rejected by the publishers. Um, and so it continued. Um, I, I, I went then, I had a, a period when I was working, uh, I worked as a publisher's sales rep for a while, so that was my kind of first inroad into, into the book world, um, the practical world of books and book selling. And then I went back to Edinburgh University to do a PhD uh, in, again in history and ended up um, uh, doing a history degree that really um, flowed into, into the literary area um, very significantly. And it was a, ended up being a PhD about uh, the works of Walter Scott, who I had never read until that point. Uh, and the four years I was doing that degree, I think I read just about everything that Scott had, had written with the um, exception of his uh, life of Napoleon, which I've told is very good. So I'm going to go back to that at some point. Um, anyway, as I said, uh, one of the other thing, reasons why I went back to study then was because I thought that if I was going to actually make any headway around this ambition of being a writer, I would have to connect with other people who are in the same business, in the same world. And again, mention has been made previously today uh, about the existence of the small literary magazines. And they, they were a thriving number of them uh, uh, in Scotland at that time. Um, Lines Review, Chapman, the Edinburgh Review, King Crastus, uh, and so on. And I began to send work off to these, these magazines, poems usually, sometimes short stories, and one or two of them gradually began to publish me, which was amazing. I kind of made it a rule to myself that I would always have something out there in the post in, in the chance that, um, that it might be accepted. Um, but those small magazines were really important for me because not only did they publish start publishing my work, but also particularly um, through Chapman magazine and Concrastus, I actually, it was a two-way process because they were publishing some of my work, but they were also, they were also educating me about Scottish literature and language um, massively. I used to read Concrastus, which had tiny, tiny print and was pretty hard work, actually. I used to read it cover to cover. Every single item and article and review in there, I, I devoured. Um, so it was a very important um, learning experience for me. Um, as I said, uh, my experience as a writer is not the same as anybody else's experience. So all I can do is sort of uh, tell you what happened to me in the context of this of this day's conference celebrating uh, the, the 50 years of the ASLS. One of the other things that that period though did in the, in the mid to late 80s was it introduced me to a lot of other writers who I would probably would not have met. I, 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 one of them being Alan Rear, who's, who's here today obviously. Alan, uh, in about 1986, I think, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was the um, the arts editor of Radical Scotland magazine, but Alan was just about to shoot off to New Zealand. And um, so he handed me his file, which was basically, a, I think, a, a paper bag full of, full of things. And I became the, liter the arts editor of, of Radical Scotland. And again, we, Radical Scotland was a political magazine, but it, it had a, a strong literary and cultural uh, element to it. We published a lot of poems. We published a short story every issue. We published people like Ian Crichton-Smith and Donald S. Murray, 
And I think we also published very early stories by Janice Galloway and I think I'm right in saying by A.L. Kennedy as well. So we, and Dillis Rose and Brian McCabe, these were regular contributors to the magazine. I remember I did an interview, an early interview with Ian Banks. So I met people through that world that I would never have otherwise have met. And the other thing that I was doing at that time was I had a part-time job as a bookseller in Waterstones. And at Waterstones, was revolutionizing the, the book trade at that point by staying open late into the evenings and by holding regular and very, very popular uh, literary events. Again, this is before the age of book festivals. Um, but in some respects, I think you could say that, that, that what Waterstones did was it, it sort of sowed the seed of how um, um, those kind of literary events, readings and so on, could be expanded into what later became the book festivals. Um, and again, through that, by, by, by being a bookseller and being there when these events were taking place, I met the previous generation of Scottish writers, people like Ian Crichton Smith and Norman McCaig and Sorley McLean and, and, and so on. And that was a, a, a huge privilege um, to me, but also of, of great interest because I was already devouring their works. Uh, and to actually meet these people face to face was, was really quite significant. Um, and I should also say that one of the things I've experienced as a writer over the years is that um, by and large, um, obviously there are folk that have their differences with other folk, but by and large the Scottish writing community is a very mutually supportive community. Um, I don't think we really see each other as rivals, but we see each other as fellow workers. And I enjoyed a lot of, of, of really supportive uh, um, uh, kindness from people like Ian Creighton Smith and Brian McCabe and Dillis Rose, Ron Butlin, Eddie Morgan, Robert Crawford, who, who I met around about that time, uh, and, and so on. And, and I think that all that did was to, to help give me more confidence that my stuff was worth doing and, and worth continuing to put out there. Um, there's been lists of, of, of names mentioned all day today um, and, and uh, there are two names I just would just drop in uh, because I got to know these folk at this time as well, who I don't think have been mentioned by anybody yet. One is, is, is uh, the late Janet Paisley, who was a great friend and um, a really remarkable woman who um, came from uh, a background of great difficulty and adversity and, and was also somebody who wrote poetry, plays, fiction, short fiction, novels, um, uh, uh, made films and wrote in English and in Scots. And uh, I learned a huge amount from Janet as well. And the other person I'd briefly like to mention because he seems to get slightly forgotten uh, is, the, is in the history of Tartan Noir and, and, and the, the debt to, to Willie McIlvany and so on, which is absolutely correct. Um, people tend to forget the name of Frederick Lindsay um, a, a really great writer. Um, he wrote a book called Brond, which was brilliant. Uh, and then he went on to write a number of, of other um, crime novels, which I think are really excellent. And, um, and he seems to have been a wee bit forgotten. And I just would like to name check him as well. Um, I, the other thing I would say at the time that I, all this was going on is that um, I should, I should add in, by the way, that I'm thinking about the small magazines, the other thing that occurred to me, and this is where my association with the, with the association really kicked in, as well as trying to submit regularly to the small magazines, um, sometime around the um, mid-1980s, I think it would be, the ASLS began to publish the annual volume New Writing Scotland. And that was a really significant uh, uh, outlet for many, many writers. Uh, Ian Rankin, uh, I know, had uh, early stories published there uh, and, and other folk as well. Um, and it became a sort of an annual thing to, to pick your best work and, and submit it to New Writing Scotland, um, uh, which I did religiously for some years. And I, was, I did a quick count the other day, I, and I think the first time I got something published in New Writing Scotland was in 1988. That was issue six. And then it took me, <laughs> took me another... Uh, eight years before they took the next thing from me, which was a short story. And then I had a couple more things in uh, towards the end of the 90s and early, early 2000s. But that annual volume of new writing, again, it worked as a two-way process because 
not only was there the possibility that you might get published in it, but also you got this amazing um, mixture of writing coming back at you with each with each annual volume that was published because it, it was open to anybody. So you had new writers right next to it, long established writers. You had poetry, prose, drama, short fiction, extracts from novels, etc., all mixed up together. And all the languages of Scotland, um, uh, all, all, the, all the three historic languages of Scotland at least, were represented there. Uh, and I can remember, again, as has been mentioned several times already today, I can remember the absolute shock with which in the sort of 91 to 93 period, I read um, the um, extracts from Trainspotting that, that, that Evan Welsh had published in New Writing Scotland. I remember reading these and just being electrified by the energy that was coming off the page, but also being deep shocked by what he was writing about and thinking, God, can you actually do that? Can you, can you write this stuff? And I think the, 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 the point that was raised earlier on today, um, I think it was by, by Rory, uh, was that whether Edmund Welsh was conscious, fully conscious of what, he's do, what he was doing there or not, in a sense was immaterial. I think he, in many ways he was, he's a very, very smart guy. Um, I, I've met him subsequently and, and, uh, and, and liked him and got on with him. Um, but uh, but whether it was fully conscious or he was uh, just playing around or, or reflecting the, the the world that he had been in didn't seem to me to matter. The language was absolutely fierce. The subject matter was fierce. But it was it was like it was almost like uh, touching uh, when you read those stories uh, and then something when you read when when you read Train Spotting it was it was it was a little bit like when you touch the paper you you got your fingers burnt and. Um, and that was an electrifying moment in, in, the, in Scottish writing in the last 30 years, I think. And obviously lots of other writers emulated him. Very few, I think, um, did, uh, did so particularly well. But there were other writers coming through at the same time, again, who, some of whom I, I got to know, um, who were at least as good as Irvin Welsh, Duncan McLean being, being one of the, the foremost. And I think it's a, Duncan obviously went off and, and, and had another life uh, and, and good luck to him and uh, he's still he's still there and still operating um, but I think he was one of the the, the, the best writers that came in that period and, uh, and so I think it's a shame that he he didn't continue to, to produce writing but um, he, he may well do so in the future who knows um, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, I've not to not to go on too long um, but I thought it was interesting thinking about um, my experience over the last 50 years or so uh, and comparing it to how writers starting out today might be finding uh, the, the path that they're about to, to go down or the path that they're already on. Um, uh, one of the things that really I find quite appallingly shocking is that when I met people like Ian Crichton Smith um, and uh, Douglas Dunn and other folk like that in the 1980s, they were younger than I am now. Um, so it doesn't take long before you suddenly realise you've kind of, you've moved up into the, into the, the um, what um, I think what uh, Norman McCade used to call his anecdotage. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore I am now one of the, the, the folk at the, the, the top end of the, of the scale in terms of age. And it didn't really take long to get there, which is a bit scary. Um, but, but is, it, is it easier or different for uh, writers in Scotland today than it was for me starting out? Well, the first thing I would say in response to that question is that it wasn't actually that easy then either. Um, I, I, I struggled quite a lot and, and, it, and um, if I had had to bring up a family, uh, I, I'm not sure if I would have been able to continue. Um, I, I didn't have those responsibilities, I didn't have those costs, and therefore I could live on uh, very small amounts of money um, when I had to. Um, I also benefited because by the time I, the 1990s came along, there, were, there was some of the infra infrastructure in place that we talked about. So, for example, I was able to apply, once I had my first book of stories published, I was able to apply for um, support from the Scottish Arts Council to, to write uh, a first novel. And before that, I was also able to apply uh, to be the writer in residence at Browns Bank Cottage uh, for two years in the early 90s. And that was an absolutely life-changing moment for me. For me. 
uh, not only was I um, living in and sleep, uh, the house of and sleeping in the bed of uh, Hugh McDermott, who had been such a huge influence on me 15 years earlier, um, but I had a, 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 a secure roof over my head and a stipend um, uh, that paid me uh, for doing the work that I did in the community whilst also getting on with my own work. And that two years enabled me to get out of full-time work as a bookseller and do what I've done subsequently uh, ever since. Um, so without the support of, of the Arts Council and the local authority, um, uh, at that point it was um, uh, Strathclyde region um, and Clydesdale district, but something that became South Lanarkshire. Without the support, public money support for that post, I'm not sure that I would be where I am today. Um, so yes, it wasn't always easy. Um, uh, financially, it was pretty tough at times, um, but also it was difficult to find a publisher. I'd had my first book of stories, second book of stories, uh, and some of the um, edited pieces published by the uh, uh, then relatively small Edinburgh publisher, Black and White Publishing, but they weren't really publishing fiction, long fiction at that time. And um, when I'd written my first novel, The Fanatic, I sent it around every Scottish publishing house and none of them took it. Um, and one who shall be nameless um, wrote back to me very kindly saying that they'd read it, but they thought it was a bit too Scottish for them, um, which I thought was the, one of the most bizarre statements I'd ever heard. Uh, it finally got picked up by an editor at what was then an independent publisher in London called Fourth Estate. And he had been a student at St Andrews University. And when he started reading the opening pages of The Fanatic, he recognised the Bass Rock because he used to look out on it every day from his, uh, his digs in Crail. And so it was real pure serendipity that that book got published at all and that it got published by a London publisher. But I've been published by London Publishing ever since. And part of me really regrets that. I would love to have been published by uh, a, a Scottish publisher, um, but as it transpired after those, in my first two books, um, uh, I was uh, found a, 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 a home in Penguin and I've been there ever since. And I have to say, they've been very good to me, uh, in spite of the fact that my sales really don't get much outside of Scotland and therefore I'm not a huge, I don't earn them a lot of money. I don't always pay off, earn out my advances, um, but they've been very supportive of me. Um, and so, particularly in these difficult times, I think I would be daft to go anywhere else. Um, but part of me wishes in a way that I, I was published, um, at least my novels were published by uh, a Scottish publisher. Um, however, that's, that's the way it is. And as I said, uh, uh, one of the things, again, that was mentioned earlier on is one of the, the things about a huge publisher like Penguin is that they can put some serious resource behind you in terms of marketing and so on. And that certainly, uh, helps a great deal. The other thing I was thinking about there was um, um, my second novel was uh, was a novel called Joseph Knight and uh, uh, Rory touched on this and Alan touched on this as well earlier on. I wonder now, I did start doing the research for Joseph Knight, uh, a, a novel about uh, a slave who was brought from the West Indies to Scotland in the 18th century uh, a true story and who, who won his freedom through the law courts here. I started doing the research for that in the year 2000 and the book was published in 2003. Would I now publish, would I now write that novel? I'm not sure because things have changed, the atmosphere has changed. Would, a, would such a novel written by a, a middle-aged, middle-class white person be welcomed? I'm not sure. I certainly remember thinking at the time, how was I going to do this? And I, I certainly remember that I rejected the idea of trying to impersonate um, Joseph Knight by telling the story uh, through his voice. Um, but I got pelters for that as well, um, because it was seen that the, because I hadn't done it in his voice that I was actually um, patronizing him. So, um, which of course was not uh, the intention of that novel. Um, but it's an interesting question, you know, one wonders now in the atmosphere in which we live if um, self-censorship is almost becoming subconscious, and I hope it isn't. I hope that, um, that all writers will always be bold enough to write what they need to write and what they want to say. Um, but I, I fear that the, the, the world we live in is pretty difficult for that just now, 
and perhaps a little time needs to, to go by um, for it to, 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 um, to just settle down again a, a bit. That's not to say, of course, that I don't agree that um, the, the voices that we hear through Scottish literature are sometimes uh, a, a wee bit um, the same. Um, but having said all of that, having said that, there are voices of people of colour coming through. There are also, again, as has been said so many times already today, the, 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 the male dominance of Scottish literature, I think, has, um, has been well and truly broken. And it's just brilliant to see so many strong female uh, voices in poetry, fiction and, 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 and play, play, uh, playwriting as well coming through. Um, I, I'm not sure if I can go on very much more. I, I should really talk about um, um, Scots language as well. Um, obviously, I've not just been a writer, I've been an editor and a publisher and, um, and HEQ has taken up a lot of my time. Um, but I think it's brilliant that uh, HQ will, I think by the end of this year, have published something like 80 titles over the 20 years of its existence. Um, many of them are translations um, rather than uh, original work. And that's partly because it's so expensive to um, produce, uh, to, to, to commission illustrations. Um, so we found that we can um, do what we want to do by by doing translations of ex already existing works, such as works by, as as already has been mentioned, um, Roald Dahl or Julia Donaldson uh, or whatever. There's, there's many that we've done. Some of these are sell have sold 40, 50, 60 thousand copies, which dem demonstrates, I think, that there is an absolute hunger uh, uh, out there for books in Scots for young people. I'd love to see a, 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 a more work coming through for um, for adult readers, but that's already beginning to happen. There's a whole new wave of Scots writing, writing in Scots happening, and in fact, so much of it that I, I'm 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 beginning to run out of I'm beginning to 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 have to go away and and catch up on it because there's so much of it. Um, just to finish off very quickly, um, when I was a bookseller in the uh, mid '80s, um, you could have pretty much put the whole of what was then considered to be Scottish literature on about three shelves of a, of a, of a bookshop. Um, that changed very rapidly in that, in that uh, decade. And since then we've had this fl flowering and flourishing of, of uh, Scottish fiction and poetry and everything else. So much so that I, I used to think that I could keep up with more or less everything new being published that was Scottish literature. It's impossible to do that now, and that's a very, very good thing. Um, going forward, thinking about writers now, is it easier for them than it was for me? I don't think it is. I think it's more difficult that you don't have the outlets of the small magazines in quite the same way. And although there are perhaps um, many opportunities, including online opportunities for publication, there's also the fact that, that, that there are so many other voices out there competing for attention and space. And uh, I'm not sure that I would have got to where I am now um, if I was starting out now, um, sort of 50 years down the line from now. But who, who knows? Um, the one thing I would say is that all writers, regardless of whatever age they're, they're, they're born in and live in, they have to, if they want to succeed, they have to show a huge amount of resilience and uh, and uh, thrownness, they obviously have to have ambition, but they also have, I think, to have a voice that stands out and that um, gives them something that's slightly different from whatever else is going on. And I don't think whatever whatever I write, whatever the voice that I have is, I don't think I would have had it if it hadn't been for my immersion in Scottish language and literature over the last, certainly over the last 30, 40 years of, of my life. And an awful lot of that is down to the ASLS of which I've now been a member for, I don't know, 30, 35 years, something like that. Um, uh, I le I've learned a massive amount from the ASLS and its publications and its conferences and so on. And I would conclude just by saying a, a really big thank you to all of the folk involved in the ASLS, past and present, unsung heroes and heroines, all of them, who've done massive amounts of uh, usually unpaid graft 
believing that literature, the literature and language of our country is important and they're absolutely right. And I would like to finish by applauding the ASLS for everything it's done in the fifth, last 50 years and I hope it has another 50 years to go. Thank you. Thanks so much, James. That, that's a great way to end the day, I think. Of course, we still have our AGM to come, um, and so we're going to want a break before that. But I think given that we started five minutes late for James, we probably have a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody has anything they would, they would like to ask James or any comments they'd like to add. quite a lot of us here now so I'm having to scroll up and down to see um, if there are any questions. No? Um, Rod Rory? Uh, it's just to say James that the point you make about about self-censorship and the sense in which there's a kind of thought police going on today is, is really terribly telling and it's giving me an enormous amount of anxiety about, about where culture is just at the moment. I think it's got to pass, but in the meantime, we're living in a kind of little mo in the red book and let's denounce our teachers or denounce people that we don't agree with, where Lewis Grassic Gibbon, for example, would be accused of writing from a woman's point of view, despite taking his mother's name to do it. And David Hume is accused of living in the 18th century. I mean, this is a kind of mad insanity, but it's got to pass, surely. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it will pass, bec partly because it is insanity and a, a, a lot, lot of it, not all of it, there, there, are, there are aspects of it that absolutely are, are come from, uh, are there for good reasons and, and we shouldn't uh, fail to address uh, the issues that need to be addressed and address them properly. But I agree with you that uh, uh, there is a lot of madness around. It's not helped by social media, of course, um, because um, it's, it's very difficult to have the kind of conversations we're having today, even online, um, if, you're, if you're actually conducting your affairs um, on, on, on Facebook, let alone on Twitter, which seems to me to be one of the great um, evils of the world we currently live in, because it brings any kind of fruitful discussion down to um, to uh, camps uh, and you are either in one camp or another and it's it's not helpful it's not useful and it, it to me that goes against the spirit of exactly the kind of what the, the ASLS and organizations like it stand for it goes against what education is about so I feel I, I have to be optimistic and think that this will pass um, but there will be damage done in the meantime, I think, and that's that's a great shame. Thank you, James, Rory. Any other questions anybody wants to ask or points they want to make? Um, Alan? Just, just very briefly again to pick up on that, James, I think, in a way with Rory, has returned us to Rory's point at the beginning, that the... the, the what that, what that endurance and resistance and, and the ability to, to see this situation passing depends upon so much is, I think, partly that what, what Rory identified as the bloody mindedness of the writers and the, and the chaos of the culture that's somewhere deep down that's drawn upon in ways that cannot be predicted and cannot be controlled entirely. And I think that's one aspect of what you were talking about with Irvin Welsh. But the other thing is that that's a component part of what the ASL has, has looked after, looks after. The New Writing Scotland anthology, the idea that new writers can be fostered and given an opportunity, given a platform in that way across decades. And the other two things, the aspect of the ASLS's activities in terms of scholarship and in terms of making sure that the research that's done changes the scene in such a way as we've witnessed today. And the third thing in terms of the general sense of education in schools primary and secondary. So you've got all these, these three sort of very different but overlapping and mutually supportive activities which run counter, absolutely counter, to the censorship and self-censorship, which is, a, as hopefully we're saying, a kind of fashion, which is a very dangerous and infectious contagion, which is a far more dangerous contagion than some others. Um, but it too will pass. So here's the next 50 years. 
<laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Thank you, James. I think I think your idea that you have to be thrown to be a Scottish writer. I think here's to thrownness is what we'll, <laughs> we'll say. <laughs> I, think you have to, I, have to, I think you have to be thrown to be a writer full stop. I don't think yeah. that's necessarily a Scottish character. I, I don't think we can claim it just for <laughs> Scottishness, no. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, James. Um, and uh, do we take a, a break now? Uh, is that what happens? Yes, I, I think so, Ali. Well, I think we're.